Hi, I'm Alan Border. Tonight, Crash chats with New Zealand's greatest ever player. He was born in Christchurch in 1951. In 86 test appearances, he made over 3,000 runs. And he took 431 wickets, of which I was quite a few. He had an incredible average of 22.29. He is Sir Richard John Hadley, and he is a true cricket legend. Welcome, Sir Richard. Great to see you. Good to be here. Oh, I want to start with your basic love for the game. Now, we could talk stats and all that, but I always remember you had that old autograph book with how many autographs was it of Test cricketers? Well, I reckon uh, a good 1,800. Wow. Uh, it started with um, Charlie McCartney, one of the great Australian players. I think he was the first entry. Then you got players like Bert Oldfield and Bradman. And what's your favourite autograph of all time that you've got, cricket or outside cricket? Nelson Mandela, which might surprise a lot of people. And um, I remember being in South Africa in um, uh, the early 1990s. Uh, and that's, of course, when uh, Mandela was the president uh, of South Africa. It was at Johannesburg, the Wanderers' Ground. And there was the lunch break. And uh, I was fortunate to have lunch in the same room. And I thought I'd be a bit cheeky here, actually. And I went up to him and I asked him, would you mind signing my autograph book, please, sir? Which he uh, duly did. So I value that uh, greatly. Now, I watched you walk in the studio and I thought, I wonder what shape the old fella's in now. When you were walking strong... Old fella? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I should say, sir, old fella. But uh, what shape you're in now? And, and you look in, in, in quite good shape. What state were you at the end of your career? Like, what needed replacing? <laughs> what needed replacing? Well, um, you know, I've been through... This body's been through a lot. I had open-heart surgery uh, within six months of retiring in 1990. Had Achilles tendon operation. Of course, you get your pulled muscles, that sort of thing. Uh, only three years ago, after bowling something like 100,000 cricket balls during my uh, career, uh, had a right hip replacement and left knee replacement. But that's just a legacy of uh, all that bowling, the wear and tear that uh, you put your body under. And uh, I can tell you it was all worthwhile because uh, I certainly have no regrets. And it's lovely that you, you do think like that because... Had you been around today, you'd have been far more pampered. I mean, you were working at Woolworths as a young guy, weren't you, and ducking to training, I mean, with virtually no support system at all, was well, it? Well, no support system outside encouragement from, uh, from family. Uh, of course, we played the game as, as amateurs uh, in my year, in the, in the 70s uh, particularly. But, yes, I started at Woolworths, um, even uh, when I was at high school on Friday nights. I would uh, go there and stock shelves, and when holidays came, I'd do the same thing. But chose to go into Woolies um, as a career in the trainee management side of things. And I'd have to say that that training was the greatest sort of experience I had in the business world because it taught me the eye for detail. It was, it was very, very important to me. And speaking of detail, your dad, Walter, who was New Zealand's first test captain and accountant, was famous for it, wasn't he? You know, meticulous. And now you're trying to preserve his memory, aren't you, by... by uh, printing his famous diaries from, yes, from well, an early tour, right. is that right? Well, Dad was captain of the 1949 New Zealand Tour of England and that was a remarkable tour in its own right. Uh, they played four test matches and drew four of them. Uh, they played 37 uh, first-class games on that tour and were only beaten once on a rain-affected pitch and they even played a game in, uh, in Germany, would you believe? And so it's his story, it's his diary and uh, I, I wanted to honour him uh, I wanted to respect the uh, the 49ers, as they were known, uh, known as. Uh, on the boat trip, it took 37 days to get from Wellington to Southampton, so they built a common bond and camaraderie, which I think uh, was, was significant. And people get a great appreciation of what cricket and touring and travelling and friendship was all about, you know, some 60-odd uh, years ago. You were knighted right at the end of your career. Did it change your life? Yes, it did change my life. Um, it's not the type of thing uh, that you plan to play your career to be uh, acknowledged or rewarded that way. Uh, others wanted to recognise my achievements over a long period of time because I had an 18-year international uh, career and I was able to uh, perform and have some lovely records. Uh, it was tremendous. Uh, but when you run on to Lord's Cricket Ground on my last tour in 1990 as Sir Richard, it can't get any better than that. Uh, I still played two test matches. In fact, I think I'm the only cricket knight to ever be knighted to uh, and still playing at the same time. So um, it changed my career. Uh, there's a lot of respect uh, with it, uh, but there's an obligation as well. 
and that is to, uh, to be, do, be doing the right thing and support charities and be a good person. And you'll always be remembered, of course, for your 9 for 52 at the Gabba, with the high point of your career and, and swing bowling at its best. When you think back to that day, uh, and how did you arrive at it? Like, what was the preparation which saw you become the master that day? Well, there was nothing special leading up into, uh, into that test match. We'd played a couple of uh, first-class games, I think South Australia and Queensland. I think I had one wicket in those two games. Uh, Glenn Turner, um, our coach at the time, he had noticed in practice a um, day or two before the test match. He says, Richard, uh, you're bowling mid-crease or too wide of the crease. I want to get you closer and closer so that you bowl more straighter or direct, more uh, line to, uh, wicket to wicket, line to line. And uh, so he stood there in, in the umpire's position and um, I said, Glenn, uh, you're pushing me too wide. And he said, right, I will work this out. So the end result was we'd measured six feet behind the stump, scratched a line, he stood behind it, it allowed me to get in. And now I hadn't noticed that umpires were pushing me wider, generally in games. And then he had to leave uh, and look after somebody else and put a rubbish bin <laughs> on that line. Wow. So it was a rubbish bin that actually helped defeat Australia in that test match. In fact, right throughout the series, it was uh, 33 wickets in that three-match series. It was pretty special. And the thing is that I think all sports people, business people, you strive for perfection and you never get anywhere near it. But that's the closest that I could get to it because nine in the first innings, caught one as well to be on the scorecard 10 times, six wickets in the second, 15 for the match. I mean, that set the tone. And whilst it was a significant individual performance, of course, you mustn't forget Martin Crowe's 188 and John Reed's 108. Uh, and that was our first win in Australia. So we created history and um, that's something I'll never forget. The incredible thing about that, only a few years earlier, you were on the verge of a nervous breakdown, weren't you? And I think one of the things you have done in your life has been open not just about the highs but the lows. And I think, you know, you were very candid about the fact that that for a while you, your life was falling apart, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very difficult. We're talking 82, 83. Uh, I was on the road, uh, busy, wouldn't say no to anyone. I would accept all sorts of invitations. I, I played in a charity game, got a bit of heat stroke, heart palpitations, dizzy spells, these sorts of things. And I just became too obsessional and too negative, depressed, didn't want to get out there and, uh, and do any training or running, uh, or let alone bowling or playing cricket. So this compounded itself over a period of four or five months. And uh, somehow I had to get out of it. And fortunately, I met a fellow called Graham Felton, who sadly passed away just recently. Uh, and he started to get me more focused and on track and develop some self-belief and confidence and goals, and give me a purpose, because I lack purpose. I just lack direction. Uh, and it was through him that, that um, made a significant difference. Uh, played in that uh, series uh, against England in 83. Uh, he beat, a, beat England in 12 hours, one minute, and got, a, got 99 in that match and, and a few wickets. England didn't get 90 in either inning, so it was a great victory. But that performance, that game, got me back on track as far as cricket was concerned and of course the next seven years was uh, was history after that. You must have been so tightly wound, it must have been incredible. Yes, but uh, it, it actually leads on to uh, to the heart problems that, that I actually had because I said I had heart palpitations, dizzy spells and all these sorts of things and within um, six months of retiring from playing the game in 1990, my test career had finished. Um, you know, I was uh, flat out. I mean, uh, I had a massive uh, heart attack down in Dunedin and um, very quickly I was on medication. Uh, if I had medication, it would have been for life, so the other option was to have open heart surgery. So interestingly enough, on the 9th of July 1990, I bowled my last ball in Test cricket at Edgbaston and one year to the day thereafter, the 9th of July 91, I was on a surgeon's table having open heart surgery. And that was the greatest fight, the greatest test of my life was coming to terms with going into the unknown, going through the process of surgery, recovering, which took uh, six to seven months before you felt as though you got your strength and confidence back again. But it taught me some valuable lessons as well that life is to be respected and not to be abused and wasted as sometimes you see with people with drugs and alcohol and uh, all sorts of other problems. 
here I am basically having a second chance and uh, to do some good in my life. And uh, that's why I'm involved in a good number of charities and giving back these days. Yeah, it's interesting listening to the man on the couch with me here. You know, you seem so so mellow these days and I, I struggle to compare to the, 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 the fire-breathing dragon of the 80s when you were just so focused. You know a what I mean? Absolutely. I know exactly what you're saying. I mean, I um, played the game hard. I like to think I played it fair. Uh, I gave everything that I had. Uh, I was um, a very intense person, certainly focused and wanted success. And once I got to 300 test wickets to become one of six in the history of the game to get there, there was still five ahead of me. And I wanted to knock them off one at a time till I got to number one. Uh, got Ian Botham's world record uh, in India in, um, in uh, 88 and then went on to be the first to get 400 test wickets. Now, that was my Everest. Mm -hmm. You know, that's as high high as I could go in the game. And then it was time for me to bow out and it was time for Kapil Dev to go beyond uh, my record and then Courtney Walsh going to 500 and then Warney and Murley and these guys have taken it to another level. And I admire and I appreciate and respect um, the performances of those players because I know what it takes, the sacrifices you have to make uh, to get to the top of the world. They're big names, aren't they? Dev, Imran, Botham, Hadley, and, and it was that beautiful era of all-rounders. Uh, putting your selector's hat on now, if you had to choose one, the best of the best, if you'd say, all right, I, I just won, it would be? I've always said Imran, uh, and I say that because uh, as a batsman, he could bat anywhere in the top six, sometimes in the top four and play any type of innings, uh, depending on the state of the game and what was required. So he was a classy batsman. Uh, as a bowler, he was express. Uh, and because he bowled wide of the crease, you know, he angled the ball in and got it to run away uh, to, uh, to slip as well. So he was a handful as a bowler. Fine captain, did a lot for Pakistan cricket, a useful fielder. That's not taking anything away from both of them, who was destructive and great for the game. Uh, and, of course, Kappel was always uh, performing con consistently well throughout in, in tough conditions and uh, Asian conditions and, and did remarkably well. Now the hard question, is Callis ahead of Imran and is Sobers ahead of both of them? Oh, that's, it's a judgmental thing. Look, uh, what uh, Callis has been able to achieve statistically, there's no doubt that he's the greatest uh, all-rounder in the history of the game. You can't deny his statistics. Uh, but when you look at somebody like Sobers, how he was a flamboyant player, an entertainer, uh, wonderful stroke maker, could tear an attack apart. The fact that Sobers could bowl quick left arm, slow left arm, brilliant slipsman, um, great for the game in the era that he played. And his name will always come or will be in, up, up near the top every time. Crowds came famously came hard at you, didn't they? Uh, there was didn't the, they? <laughs> there was that infamous chant, you know, Hadley's oh, yeah. a wanker, and I've, I've got yeah. to bring it up. Yeah. Was that how did you cope with that? Because initially it ground you down, didn't it? Yes. You were most upset. Yes. yes. Well, because it was a new experience, uh, to have crowds attacking you in an arena, which is a hostile uh, place to be in anyway, because you've you've got the match situation and uh, and these sorts of things, plus the banter on the field of play, and all of a sudden. You know, the arena is erupting with crowd participation. And I took a very negative and hurtful view on that, uh, as some people uh, would do. But I remember Greg Chappell saying to me, he says, Richard, uh, the fact that the crowd are signalling you out is a compliment. Accept it as a compliment. So I had a choice of one of two things. Either let them get on top of me and be negative and destructive, uh, which is what they want, because they felt that I was a threat uh, to their team, or use it as a motivational tool, as a positive to uh, you know, use your bowling, your skills um, to take it to another level. And if I look back at my career, I think I got 130-odd test wickets against Australia. And uh, that's more test wickets against any uh, other team uh, that I played against. So I was able to, uh, I was strong enough to turn it around. And so I'm pretty pleased and, uh, and proud of, uh, of that. What about some of the lighter sledges, things in Australia, whether it be crowd or something, singling you out, and you think, oh, that's, that's not bad. I do uh, recall one or two sort of uh, funny things. Um, 
uh, there was a banner at, uh, at Brisbane, can't remember what year it was now, and it says, it says Hadley sucks, S-U-X. And I thought, Australians still can't spell sex. You know, it's just sort of <laughs> one of those things. But uh, I remember on a rubbish bin, it says, Hadley can bowl faster than Lily. And then under that, it said rubbish. <laughs> so, you know. That's not bad. So, so those things uh, uh, happen, and you remember those, and, and you take them in good light. And of course, you were so inspired by Dennis Lilly, weren't you? It was just a, you, know, you almost studied him, didn't you? And I, I, was he as big an influence on you as was often portrayed? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I can sit here and say, look, Dennis Lilly was a huge influence in my career. And we're going back to the, uh, the late 70s when I first played against him. Uh, and I watched him, I studied him, I watched video footage, I had the chance to talk to him, have a, have a beer in the dressing room, and you can learn a lot in 20, 30 minutes in a dressing room than what you could in a whole year uh, just by, by, you know, watching video stuff. And to me, Dennis was that 100% man. In any given situation, he would, he would give 100%. And that is all you can ask for and all you can give. And the thing about Dennis was, as far as a role model was concerned, is that he was the epitome of what fast bowling was all about. Big, strong, aggressive, confident, great skills, wonderful technique. Uh, just as importantly, he had a presence on the field, which was intimidation in itself. So you knew as a batsman that you were in a battle. And that's what the game of cricket is all about. It's a contest between not only one country against another or one team against another. It's the one-on battles, the duels that you have between the bat and ball. And whoever performs, uh, you know, in, in that moment is the one that's going to have uh, success. And, of course, you weren't a sledger, were you? you? You just... Why was that? Well, I think in my early days, uh, you want to make an impression and, and you think to be tough, you've got to stand there and say a few words and go off. And I learnt very quickly in, um, when I played county cricket from 78 through to 87, a wonderful time and experience in my life, that all that rubbish just gets knocked out of you. It's, 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 it's not respected, it's not enjoyed, it's unnecessary. And uh, for the next 12 years, I hardly said boo to anyone. And I remember Greg Matthews saying um, that Hadley is the most intimidating bowler that I faced because he didn't say anything, but he had a presence. You knew he was there. And after I'd bowled a ball and if, I'd, if he had played and missed, I would stand there and it might be a nod, a wink, a glare, or I'd turn my back and get back to my bowling mark and come in again. And he knew that he was still in a contest. Now, I regard that as a wonderful compliment. And when I talk to young fast bowlers, yes, you've got to have a presence. You've got to have some fire in your belly. Do all these sorts of things. But sometimes you don't need to say anything to be effective as a, as a strike bowler. It was interesting, though, you did use your newspaper column just to lift the temperature, didn't you? I remember one time when you got Dean Jones out a couple of times, you just said, straight out lead, I've got the wood on Dean Jones. And it just, I think it rattled him. And that was calculated, wasn't it? Well, the interesting story about that was that uh, Dino had been asked by some newspaper reporter, uh, and he was reported in the papers, um, what do you think of Hadley as a bowler? And he said, he's just like any other bowler. And we'd never played against each other. We'd never had a game. So the Gabba was the first test. So I guess we're talking around about uh, 86, 87, somewhere around there. And uh, he chipped one onto his stumps early on for not many. And so it was 1-0 to me. I think he got 30 not out in the second innings in Australia, won the game. Then we went to uh, Adelaide and he got uh, a three-ball duck and did well to score naught. So those three balls were uh, were pretty impressive. So uh, so I got him there. So uh, we, we, it's two one. Then I think I got him twice at Melbourne, and then got him again uh, in New Zealand in Test cricket. I think I had the wood on him in Test cricket. We see each other, we talk about it, and, and these these sorts of things. We have a bit of a laugh about it. So his comeback is that I'm his only Test wicket. He got oh, he got really? me out at Adelaide, and that's probably. Uh, one of my most embarrassing moments in my career, I've got to say, and the other one being Mike Whitney, who I couldn't get out in 87, and he faced that final over in that test match at the MCG to draw the test match, and uh, old Whitty hung in there for that uh, for those six balls. But he did give you 
uh, a ball, didn't he, recently? Uh, it was yeah. the only five-wicket haul ball that you you were you hadn't had, and he gave it to you, didn't he? Yes, he did. Uh, in fact, he hung on to it for uh, probably 18 years <laughs> or more. Uh, good story, that, because, um, you know, he survived the, the last ball. And um, I went up to him, and you might have seen film footage that I put my arm around him and tapped his helmet and said, well played, you've done something great for Australia. And uh, Ian Smith, our wicketkeeper, had the ball. And when you get five wickets in innings, it's traditional that it goes to the bowler. And I said to Smithy, where's the ball? And he said, I've given it to Whit." <laughs> I said, why have you given it to Whit? Because he's done something wonderful for uh, for Australia. He, he deserves it. So Whit hung on to it. And um, just over the years, um, and only until recently, we're talking about six months ago now, uh, that at a, an event, uh, he came on stage and uh, wanted to do what he felt was the right and honourable thing to do and to build trans-Tasman relationships and life friendships and these sorts of things, uh, he made that ball available. So I certainly appreciate and respect that wonderful gesture. You once said you would like to see ball tampering legalised in cricket, or at very least a form of it. Is that true? Well, yes, I did say that. It was probably more of a tongue-in-cheek comment because there was a lot of uh, criticism in the game and speculation that uh, bowlers and fielders were playing with the ball. And, of course, under the laws of cricket, that is illegal. And uh, the umpires were having to uh, to um, watch this and, you know, just ch check things out. And I thought the easiest way to overcome that is to legalise uh, ball tampering. And what I mean by that is you can't use things like bottle tops, knives, scissors, or those things, those things. But what's wrong with getting your fingernail under the quarter seam or picking the seam? Because it allows the ball to have a different characteristic for one thing. It develops another skill. The batsman's got to combat that, particularly on flat pitches, just to balance the game. And it means the umpires don't have to monitor the situation. So it takes all that uh, out of the game. Uh, and the ball's going to get to a state where it's... Um, back it anyway, so sooner or later it's going to be replaced. So I made a comment uh, like that that uh, may have been taken out of context, but I actually see some positives with it. What about match fixing? You once said that you felt convicted match fixers should have their cricket records totally erased, which is a, a fascinating measure. I've never heard anyone else say it, but explain that. Well, we've got to talk of a principle here that uh, match fixing, bribery, corruption is... Um, a virus in the game and it needs to be eradicated uh, to have players underperforming uh, themselves or influencing others for money, uh, for reward uh, and affecting the, the flow of the game, uh, doing things that are contrary to what the other players are doing and effectively trying to lose uh, games uh, is daylight robbery. And the most severe thing you can do outside jail time or fines or suspensions or anything like that is to remove that player's records from the game as though he never existed because he shouldn't be in the game. So that's uh, that's where I came from uh, on this. And in many ways, I still stand by that. But that's not going to happen. You know, if somebody is in trouble, then it's going to go through a process and then the appropriate action will, um, will take care of itself. You're a proud Christchurch man. You always have been. I, I can only imagine the devastation you must have felt with the earthquakes. It, uh, the city's still rebuilding. It sounds like a very long process. Well, it is. Um, something like 1,800 buildings in the CBD area alone have been uh, dismantled. And um, the rebuilding is, is happening, but it's going to be a 20, 25-year development. You're a very measured man, but when... Pierce Morgan faced up to Brett Lee in the Nets. You rang up and offered a newspaper column where you stridently criticised the whole episode, didn't you? you? You sounded really angry, which is unusual for you. Uh, I was very, very concerned. When I first saw it happen uh, at Adelaide in the Nets, and I know it was a gimmicky thing, it was set up, uh, but as it developed, there's no doubt in my mind, even though Piers Morgan was well padded up, protected, that Brett was deliberately bowling intimidatory deliveries, looking to hit the body, the upper part of the body, which put Piers Morgan into a dangerous, life-threatening situation. And I thought, this is not cricket. This is not good for youngsters to see this uh, happening. And former players sort of laughing um, and, and almost at times showing, oh, is this really happening? It wasn't a great image for cricket. Now, Brett will have his own views on that. And if I see him, look, I'll tell him, you know, I think that was the wrong thing to do. And he says, well, 
I, I disagree. Well, okay, we'll agree to disagree. But uh, with the unfortunate situation with Phil Hughes, you know, that could have happened as well to Piers Morgan if he had turned his head in a certain direction at a certain time and got hit. Uh, anything could have happened. Then how would the bowler have felt? Of course, you played in the underarm game, and uh, Jeremy Coney's got an unusual take. He thinks that the underarm was the best thing that happened to New Zealand cricket because it galvanised the whole nation. Do you agree? Oh, I think so. Uh, it was something that was unnecessary. You've got to remember that at that time, uh, we remember it well, February 1st, uh, 1981, MCG at 5.42pm, but that, that, that's just a little aside. <laughs> but who's counting? Who's counting? But uh, we, we, may, uh, we may forgive, but uh, we won't forget. But the point is that we had to get six runs to tie the match, not to win it. But had we tied the game, it meant there had to be an extra game. And, and Greg has come out and said that he wasn't in the right mental state and he didn't want to have to play another game. So he actually pulled this tool out from somewhere. And you've got to remember that it, uh, it was within the rules of one-day cricket. You could bowl underarm. Goodness knows why it was there, but you could do it legally. Uh, but, of course, the big question was, was it within the spirit of the game? And, of course, a lot of people came out, including Richie Benno, uh, that it wasn't in the spirit of the game. And Greg had, has to live with that, and I think he's handled it remarkably well, to be honest. Uh, they even have reunions now around the place, uh, I think, with Brian McKechnie, who was the unfortunate batsman uh, at the time. But I remember Rob Muldoon, who was our Prime Minister at the time, he said uh, it was appropriate that the Australians were dressed in yellow because it was an act of cowardice. So the country got in behind it, and, um, yeah, look, um, it's, it's part of history. The good thing that came out of it, of course, is that underarm bowling was, was banned straight after, basically. So that, that was um, the good thing. Not in the spirit of the game, Richard, but no one could ever say that about your career. There's never been anyone like you for New Zealand before you arrived or anyone since. It's been an outstanding career and a joy to have you on the show. A true cricket legend. Well played. Thank you. Pleasure.